Video posted to an Islamic State website Tuesday purporting to show the execution of a Jordanian pilot. Brutal images from the long and elaborately produced video show the hostage, Muad al Kasespe, identifying himself to the camera. He's then placed in an iron cage and burned alive. It did not take long for the Jordanian government to respond. After the video was made public of their pilot being set on fire and burned to death, they executed the prisoners that were at one time being discussed in a swap for lives. Is this playing into the hands of ISIS? And does this prove that no matter what governments do, vermin will always find a way to exist and thrive? Let's welcome back to Midpoint, retired U.S. Army Lieutenant Colonel, senior fellow at the London Center for Policy Research and expert analyst in counterterrorism, Tony Schaefer joins us. Tony, good to talk to you again. Hey, thanks for having me. Good to be on. Tony, I know that you're in the middle of transit right now, so we're going to get right. as much as we can from you here as you're moving from place to place because everybody sure. in the Intelligence Committee right now is very busy. But with regard to the burning of an individual, putting it out like this in a slickly produced video, in your opinion and the opinion of those you speak with, was this a tactical mistake by ISIS? Because at this point now, they are getting exactly what they didn't want, and that is a galvanization of people around the world against their cause. Well, yes and no. And let me split the answer in two. First, uh, if you look at it in terms of the civilized world, yes, this is, uh, this is bad for ISIS because this will indeed galvanize a lot of the West against them. This is the, the same sort of miscalculation, I think, um, Osama bin Laden made regarding the 9-11 attack. Instead of uh, creating a global caliphate, it created essentially his own demise. With that said, you know, ISIS is, is made up of elements of al-Qaeda and the Ba'ath Party uh, of Saddam Hussein. So I'm saying that this, this was an effective move on their part by the fact that they did this for purposes of their audience, for both recruiting and basically playing to their base. Let's remember a lot of politics in our own nation. Uh, people do things based on trying to stimulate their own base. Well, that's what this is, Ed. This, is, this video, as horrific as it is, actually does appeal to a certain percentage, a certain sect of the Muslim faith, uh, primarily those who have come up to the most extreme version of Sharia, uh, basically perpetrated by, the, uh, by the, uh, the, the Saudis, you know, about 150 years ago. Uh, but with that said, you know, this, this, this is a recruitment video. And so much of what they're going for is the image of the strong horse. And we've talked about this before. So much of the Arab culture in particular respects the strong horse. So this is both meant to frighten, to show any pilot who goes down, who is shot down or crashes, this is your fate. This is meant to go at the individual level as well as the national level, you know, basically poking their finger in the eye of Jordan saying, see what we can do to you and you can't stop it. With regard to the two individuals at Jordan hanged in retribution for this right now, do we not need to understand that at least there's a possibility, I think it's a good one personally, that when it comes to people who are captured by governments, the people who run ISIS, their main government, if you will, sees these people as nothing more than expendable. If you want to kill them, go ahead, kill them. It does nothing to us. So to offer these people as any sort of a return is simply a moot point. Oh, it was... It was Never serious to begin with. That this was uh, my my sources tell me that uh, the, uh, the the Jordanian pilot was either killed the last week of December or the first week of, of, of January. So no, it was never a serious negotiation. This was only ISIS trying to get more, uh, you know, essentially out of the Jordanian government, basically messing with messing with their head. And yes, anybody who's captured by ISIS uh, as an ISIS follower, ISIS lone wolf, whatever you want to call it. They're dead, as, court, as far as ISIS is, is concerned. They've done, their, they've done what they needed to do, which is attack the West. So, no, this is a very sinister, very evil organization. And, again, I've said this in other interviews, that I think there is evil, if not more evil, than Nazi Germany at the height of its, if its uh, Holocaust. I've got a minute. We'll come back. We'll take a break, though, and talk more before we do. When we look at what is happening here, are we playing into their hands simply by having to go through these negotiations, by playing these videos? It would seem as this this is exactly what they want. Yeah, I think we always are obligated to take the high road. I, I think it's, it's, it's our nature, it's our culture. I think it's necessary. With that said, being an intelligence operative, we better be darn well behind the scenes doing everything, everything we can to increase our intelligence and special operations capacity. I am all for negotiating as long as you're negotiating with one hand inside of a glove ready to slug the guy when we need to. And that's what's missing here. We are not slugging them back in the way we should. We're not doing the hard job of collecting intelligence as we should. And that's why we're not getting ahead of them. 
All right, Tony, I want you to hold on that point for just a moment here. We'll take a break, come back, because on the other side of the break, what Tony just said here, the work that is going on behind the scenes, it's not just here in America. Now it falls to Jordan. Now it falls to Japan. Now it falls to so many other countries who are starting to understand what this group is all about. How do we and those fighting ISIS use this latest event to our advantage, if we can at all? That and so much more when we continue right here, where we question everything on Midpoint. ISIS shakes the world. We get back to work and back to Midpoint. Retired U.S. Army Lieutenant Colonel Tony Schaefer joins us. Tony, you used the phrase slugging back in the last segment here. It's a good phrase to use. We understand that. We need to get into this fight. We need to take it to them. We're doing it with as far as uh, airstrikes are concerned and other things we're doing to degrade them. But, Tony, there are some experts who tell us we can't slug back, we can't fight back because of the nature of this enemy, and if we do it, we're only wasting our time. So then how do we find that median, that way to actually get back at them and make it count? There's three basic ways. First, Ed, this is a war of ideas. We, uh, you know, John Kirby, God bless him, uh, John is you know, doing his best to get the word out. He talked about yesterday in his, his press conference on this that we need to uh, understand this is a war, a, a war of ideas, and it abs absolutely is. We've got to start doing what we call counter-messaging. Basically, they are basically ruling the information sphere unencumbered, uh, just the way they're doing it, Hollywood. They understand how to manipulate our thinking and our culture. We need to get ahead of that. There's ways of doing it. Secondly, for goodness sake, you know, we have the best, the brightest, uh, special operations operators in the world. If, if you let go the, the dogs of war, you would be amazed what they can do. This is a political issue, Ed, that the, the White House holds them back. Essentially, it's uh, LBJ in Vietnam all over again. President Obama, who has no military background, essentially is making all these calls like he's a qualified quarterback. He's not. Third, we have to come up with a realistic coalition of, of conventional forces led by uh, Egypt uh, that consists of Jordan, Saudi Arabia and our other allies, and let them do the heavy lifting, we will help them logistically and with intelligence. Those are the three things we must do, and simply put, Ed, uh, we don't have a strategy that is in place to actually array these things together to be effective, and that's what we must be doing to be effective in going after using the punchback against ISIS. Is there any, though, idea that we have that if we're dealing with Jordan, Egypt, any of these other countries right now, that if we give them the tools, they will really use them? Because, again, here's that pushback, Tony. People will tell us they live there, they're in the Middle East, they're too infiltrated in their government now with people who may be uh, thinking of becoming or are members of various terrorist groups. So why should we trust them? How can we trust them? I've heard that argument, and I think it's a bit overblown. First, something called enlightened self-interest. Uh, I never, never under, underestimate the action, uh, motivation of someone with enlightened self-interest. I think yesterday, Ed, Jordan got enlightened self-interest. I think these other nations recognize, too. And I mentioned, the, uh, you know, Wahhabism and Saudi Arabia being the, the, the birthplace of it. Look, no doubt, Saudi Arabia and Qatar have helped fund ISIS. With that said, I think they recognize that they've overplayed their hand. As much as I think we need to treat Saudi Arabia as a, a, an enemy at times, uh, this is a case where I think they have to be trusted to do what's necessary to survive in their current form of governance. So, again, I, I, I think we need to trust them as far as we can regarding their own interests, and that's what we should work with, their own enlightened self-interest. I'm not saying we should trust them as much as we trust Germany, England, or any of our other close allies, but I'm saying we have to allow them to do the heavy lifting because they're there and we're not. We learned today that the United Arab Emirates apparently disengaged back in December. They pulled back because even they were a little bit concerned about what might happen and the fact that they are in the Middle Eastern world itself. Will their loss mean anything to us? Uh, no. But I think in, in, in many ways we have to look at the, the coalition of the willing. And one of the things we talked about on the show here several times, and it's on our website, London Center, is uh, the idea of, a, of a, a, an Arab NATO. Now is the time to put together the, the Arab militaries we have trained. And so remember, uh, President al-Sisi, uh, the, the president of Egypt, is actually a war, war college graduate, Army War College graduate. We have invested in these militaries, and it's time we call the, you know, call our investment in, and starting use, using those resources which we've trained, which are there. And again, uh, I think it's in their interest to do what's necessary to defend themselves against ISIS. But they've barely got functioning militaries, at least those people who see the education we've given them. So if they really have not come up to the level of being a military that would be able to take on these terrorists, how can you put together all these people into a, a NATO, as you say, and have them actually be functional and effective? Leadership. It requires us to be 
They're leading them. I'm not saying we have to have our boots on the ground. I'm saying that we have to be the ones to do the heavy lifting. We're the ones that put together the original NATO, and we kept it together. NATO was really us. And I think in many ways we want to do the same thing, except, you know, obviously it's their forces that have to do the heavy lifting. They're the ones who have to work in their own interest. And I, I do believe that it's possible, not going to be easy. I'm not saying it's going to happen overnight or be easy, but it's the only viable option I see for long term going back against ISIS in a realistic way. The idea President Obama has of training 5,000 moderate, quote-unquote, Syrian uh, uh, ex- extremists is totally insane. That'll get us absolutely nothing. So at least the idea of a NATO will bring two things we don't have. Stability, I believe, long-term, you know, social interaction, as well as a viable military force that we can continue to work with. It would remain to be seen, of course, if those nations have the spine to take on somebody who is right in their backyard. That is, of course, a conversation for another day. London Center for Policy Research. We right here at Midpoint, Lieutenant Colonel Tony Schaefer, always a pleasure to have you on the show, my friend. Be well. We'll talk to you again soon. Thank you, Ed. All right. Take care. Let's turn back to America. Let's take a break from the dark side of news for a couple of moments here because we're going to be talking about this all day. Let's move on to another Super Bowl that is in the books. And there is one thing that the final numbers tell us about the American football fan. One thing, and I dare you to disagree with this. Sports professor Rick Harrow in the house. He's here with that and so much more when we continue on Midpoint. Midpoint.